You mentioned inflammation there, and I get the feeling that's a bit of a, a key word when it comes to the microbiome and also a possible explanation for how the microbiome could contribute to various disease states, these chronic conditions that uh, we see you know, very much the diseases of today anyway in developed countries. Can you break down inflammation for me? What, what is inflammation and why is this a, a problem and a potential sort of uh, unifying way to kind of explain how the microbiome may be involved in these various disease states? You want to take a crack at that? Sure. I mean, inflammation, you know, the way that me as a microbiome scientist thinks about it is like our body's way of um, paying attention to and trying to make the calculation of good versus bad bacteria. So, you know, Justin mentions this mucus lining, the microbes, you know, the human is, humans are basically a tube. And so, which is our digestive system. And our body knows that it needs these microbes. And so it's trying to keep it within this tube. The last thing that we want are these bacteria to like breach the tube, get into our circulation and cause a systemic infection. That's, that's a horrible scenario. So our immune system is paying attention to sort of what's happening within that tube. And if it gets the sense that a microbe is behaving badly, like secreting toxins or just causing trouble in the gut, it will say, okay, this microbe is, is not behaving well. I'm going to set off this inflammatory response, this immune response to keep that microbe in check. Or maybe it senses these microbes within the colon are just getting, the mucus is getting thin. They're getting really close to that intestinal lining. This is making me nervous that these bacteria are going to breach that lining and get inside my the bloodstream. I'm also going to set off an inflammatory response to push those microbes back into the gut and keep them out of the system. So it's it's a tool that our immune system uses to control the community of microbes that that we're um, that we're dealing with. And you know this could is important for the gut microbiota, but it's also important for infections. If you're you know infected with a virus your immune system needs to take care of that virus to keep you from getting sick and dying. And, and inflammation is a way that it does that. And in the past, when we would just be exposed to um, viruses periodically, and we you know, had this immune system that was well-trained, that system would work really well. But what we are starting to see in industrialized societies is that there appears to be our immune system appears to be somewhat misfiring in inflammation. It, it sets off inflammation and, and an immune response in situations that, that aren't a problem. And a perfect example of this is like um, a food allergy, for example, like peanuts in themselves aren't going to kill a person as far as like, you know, it's not a pathogenic bacteria. It's not, you know, anything that should cause a problem. But in some individuals with a severe peanut allergy, our, their immune system has decided that that peanut is life-threatening and it needs to, you know, set off all the alarms and set off this huge amount of inflammation. And so a lot of diseases that are associated with industrialization, allergies, autoimmune diseases, um, even metabolic syndrome and obesity are forms of immune system disruptions where the immune system is totally overreacting to a situation that it shouldn't be paying so close attention to. And we think that the microbiome, because it's a bacteria, these microbes that are so close to our, our own tissue are important in, in helping the immune system turn its dial towards you know, how much it's going to react to something or not. And we think in the industrialized world, world, because our microbiome has been disrupted, um, that it's turning the immune system dial in a way that is just making it freak out over every little thing that it comes in contact with. And, and a really important um, kind of piece there that Erica explained in really nice detail is that 
Um, I think commonly people hear about inflammation as a response to an infection, but what is um, something that's continually happening that people aren't aware of is this physiologically normal state of inflammation that we exist in. So it's not like in the absence of infection, our immune system is off. Mm -hmm. It's continually responding to little cues. And then, you know, there's a little bit of inflammation and then it'll say, okay, that's not a big danger. I'm going to downregulate it. There are these continual cycles of either ramping up or slight ramp up, slight ramp down kind of negative feedback loops to kind of regulate inflammation. And that, that physiologically normal state of inflammation, that background level is um, the set point that we can measure now with immune profiling and can change based on, you know, where you live and what sort of, um, you know, things are going on in your life. So all those things can change that background level of inflammation. And, and we think that it's that background level of inflammation, that set point that has been raised in industrialized countries because of bad things happening in our gut, along with a lot of other things, but that, that raised kind of chronic simmering inflammation is also what may be driving a lot of the, the Western diseases that Erica was talking about. So let me just quickly recap and, and correct me if I've heard anything wrong, but with a, a disrupted microbiome, there's often a, a loss in diversity of the microbes you can get this thinning of that mucosal layer that separates microbes from our own intestinal cells, which we want. And when we get thinning of that mucosal layer, you can see an increase in inflammatory proteins, I'm assuming. You can start to rev up the, the immune system in a, in a way that is unfavorable for our, our health. And then that can or well, the idea here is that that can contribute or predispose us to some of these chronic conditions that have an underlying inflammatory component like cardiovascular disease, various types of cancer, dementia, et cetera. Exactly right. Yeah, you've, you've stated it perfectly there, Simon. I think the, um, the uh, question is what is the normal level of inflammation for because the, you know, the having an immune system that's ready to respond to pathogens or even to vaccines to mount a good response to a vaccine, which is on a lot of people's minds right now, I think um, is is super important. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's a emerging field called systems immunology, where it's, you know, instead of looking at one marker or another marker of the immune system, it's trying to get a comprehensive picture of the immune system and really trying to understand where do you want that set point to be for the different parts of your immune system system to react optimally in these different situations. And if you're, you know, fighting an autoimmune disease, it'll likely be a different set point than somebody who's, for instance, entering, um, uh, um, for instance, immunotherapy for cancer or something like that, where you do want the immune system to rev up and respond to um, a malignancy in, in that case. So, so the, the, this question of like, where should our immune system be? Um, is a is a major one, and it will undoubtedly depend upon who the person is and what they're trying to accomplish. Is it just long life? Is it to deal with a specific condition? Um, you know, it'll totally change where you want your immune system to be situated. Sure, I'm sure that you've given some thought and probably been asked before about cause and effect, and. This gets me me wondering how certain are we that it's the microbiome and revving up the inflammation that then causes the or contributes. Uh, there may be other contributors, but at least plays a part in the development of that pathology versus the disease state occurring first and then influencing the gut in the reverse order and, and causing a loss in diversity and uh, increase in inflammation. You know, anytime I have a question like that, I feel like the answer is always both. It's probably <laughs> both things, right? Because it's a circle. It's, you know, your immune system is paying attention to your microbiome. Your microbiome is responding to what your immune system is doing. And so if you, if you, for example, get an infection, a viral infection that increases your inflammation because you're trying to fight that infection. Your microbiome is aware that that's happening and it could influence, you know, the community of microbes that's there. And maybe that community of microbes then dampens that inflammation. Maybe it, it ramps it up. And then you get into the cycle of 
the community's ramping it up and then the immune system because it's all ramped up is changing that community. So it, it does, it can form this circle and it's hard to, sometimes to figure out like, how did it all get started? Um, I think it's just important to understand that these things interplay with each other. And it could be that to, to get someone out of a pro-inflammatory state that's promoting something like inflammatory bowel disease, you may have to push on multiple levers at once. You may have to adjust that person's microbiome at the same time as you're trying to dampen their immune system, you know, using medication. And, and if you can do things at the same time, you can get that person out of that pro-inflammatory cycle that, that may be tough to break with just, you know, going after the microbes, for example. And, and to just take a step back to kind of the basic question of causation, I think it's a super interesting question that a lot of people in the field have really grappled with because, there are all of these associations, whether it has to do with inflammation or obesity, or, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of associations, both in animal models and in humans, where you see there's a disease state that corresponds to a microbiota that doesn't quite look right. There's different elements, either different species or different functions that are overrepresented. And, um, the, you know, the, um, classic way if you have um, a pathogen, for instance, a, a particular bacterial species that you think is causing a disease, the classic way of establishing causation is by fulfilling something called Cook's postulates, a set of, um, of uh, principles that you need to um, meet and formulated by um, Robert Koch, an uh, uh, incredible uh, scientist and physician. And, and what he said is, if you want to establish that a, a particular bacteria or another um, infectious agent causes disease, you need to isolate it from a diseased person, um, have actually have it in pure culture, so completely isolated, um, then administer it to a healthy organism host organism and show that you can induce that disease. Mm -hmm. And then even better, if you can eliminate the pathogen and cure the disease, you've gone even one step further in fulfilling that this single organism is causative for that, that disease. Um, when you're dealing with an entire microbial ecosystem, you know, hundreds of species, it becomes a more difficult question. Like how do you fulfill those sorts of postulates for causation? And, um, a really beautiful experiment performed by Jeff Gordon's lab um, uh, approached this for obesity, where they had a mouse model, different set of microbes in the obese mice, and they were asking this very question, are those microbes there as a result of obesity or are they contributing to or causing obesity? And so the really beautiful experiment they did was to take that microbiota from the obese mouse and put it into a non-obese mouse, a mouse that actually had no microbiota, known as a germ-free mouse, that recipient mouse, then they could test whether receiving that obese microbiota was sufficient to drive obesity. And in that case, it was. So incredibly, those mice ate exactly the same as their healthy counterparts, but just having this obese microbiota is what was enough to cause those mice to become obese, to gain weight more rapidly. And, and so that is an example of a type of experiment that can be done to address this question of, of causation when it comes to the microbiota. But you do need um, an animal model or um, another way to, to test this in a sort of a, an entire ecosystem transfer model. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting study. And that's also a good reminder. We've zoomed in, I guess, on inflammation, but it's, it's clear, or at least from my reading of the science, that the microbiome is influencing disease states potentially through other risk factors such as obesity or um, you know metabolic type of uh, pathways and that gets me uh, interested to, to have you comment how how does the microbiome affect metabolism and uh, hunger or contribute to something like obesity what what do you think could possibly explain that? Um, you know, the microbiome, so, and this probably relates to um, a little bit of background that um, we should have stepped back at the beginning and, and covered before even talking about the immune system and inflammation, but the, the gut microbiome has so many ways of influencing um, host biology. So in a very, in a very simple sense, from the standpoint of like, you know, energy harvest from diet, um, 
microbes can degrade these complex fibers, for instance, and then utilize the, the sugars that make up those complex fibers. In fermenting those sugars, they actually produce short chain fatty acids, things like butyrate that can then be taken up into our host cells, into our bloodstream. And those can actually serve as calories. So probably not a huge part of calories of the Western diet, but certainly the microbes help us salvage some calories from complex fiber. So on the one hand, caloric harvest is part of the equation. Probably a bigger part of the equation are other signals that the microbes send to us. So the microbes are constantly making interesting small molecules as part of their metabolic spinoff. They make little patterns, um, little molecular patterns, part of their cell wall and lipid membrane structure that then again, interact with, you know, get absorbed into our cells, into our bloodstream and trigger different receptors, different pathways in a variety of cell types in our bodies. And this can lead to changes in immune status, in metabolism, in signaling to the brain, um, and, and certainly influence things like, um, you know, uh, satiety, how our liver is metabolizing different substrates and so forth. So one of the I would say very difficult things in the microbiota is to establish exact molecular mechanisms just because the community is so complex. And when you talk about the biology of hundreds of species of microbes and then the 20 some thousand genes that the, the host in, you know, uh, possesses and the proteins that are encoded from those, the, um, the biology is just incredibly complex. And so we don't know exactly how gut microbes are causing obesity, but we do know from the um, microbiome transplant experiments that they are able to cause obesity. It's just a matter of now trying to map the pathways that are involved. Super interesting. And you mentioned brain there. And I, I got sent a study about a week ago, I haven't looked through this study, uh, admittedly, yet in detail, but I thought it was interesting on a, a quick glance. It was a randomized controlled trial that looked at 85% dark chocolate. I'm not sure if, if you've seen it. I can send it over. And they were looking at the uh, microbiome diversity and also mood. And in general, they saw that in the, in the group that was fed this 85% dark chocolate, which is presumably quite rich in polyphenols, it did increase the diversity of the microbiome and did improve mood state. So uh, potentially an, an interesting study to kind of dig into. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear that the effects are positive. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep some, keep some chalky in the, uh, in the diet. 